Hi everyone, welcome to SP24 and another session entitled Tipping Point On-Premises and Cloud. I'm Rob Lemire, the CEO and founder at fpweb.net. And let me tell you a little bit about myself before we get started. Uh, a little known fact about myself is that I have a U.S. Soccer Federation A license and have coached at the D1 level uh, of soccer on the women's side. Uh, my background consists of financial training as an auditor, uh, technical training as a network engineer on IBM, Novell, Cisco, and Microsoft platforms. Let's talk about SharePoint since that's why we're here. And I've been working with the product since its inception in 1999 when it was just a front page extension uh, in that web design tool. And we were the first at FP Web to host uh, SharePoint both in dedicated and multi-tenant. Uh, most recently, we architected a very large environment for one of the largest public-facing SharePoint sites, utilizing 16 fast search servers for a high-visibility shopping site. So let's dive in and, and learn some more about the uh, tipping point and how this can help you. So first thing is I want you to ask yourself, you know, who are you? Uh, and we typically have three folks uh, who make up our audiences, and one is uh, the IT pro, the other one is uh, a manager, and the other one is actual IT leadership. So put yourself in one of those buckets, if you will, and uh, I think this presentation is going to help you uh, more as we speak to those three audiences, and uh, it's usually a pretty interesting split. And the next question I would have for you is, uh, are you running uh, your IT uh, on-prem right now? So in other words, are you using uh, cloud aggressively or are you just starting to uh, test the waters, if you will? Let's fast forward to the year uh, 2016. 2016, according to Gartner, will be the year of the cloud. And that's an important date for us to remember uh, as we kind of look into the next 24 months and what that entails. Uh, so the next 24 months will be critical to your cloud strategy and the execution of that strategy. Let's talk about the landscape uh, that IT leadership is currently operating in. And it's a challenging environment. And what we're finding out right now is that the top strategic concerns of IT leaders are uh, most important to them is controlling costs, that's first. Uh, the second one is focusing IT resources on developing uh, or managing business and applications. And the third is finding more cost-effective IT, no surprise there. And then the last is better collaboration across the business. And what's important for us to take away from uh, these things, the top strategic concerns of IT leaders, is that the first three are about optimizing uh, what you have. So again, that's controlling costs, focusing IT on developing and managing business critical apps, and finding more cost-effective IT infrastructure. Those are the first three, so that's optimizing what you have. And then the last one, better collaboration across the business, is speaking to transforming the organization and getting alignment across uh, the business units. And we'll speak to uh, optimizing and transformation uh, later on. Uh, the next part about the landscape is the revenue growth over the next uh, 12 months, and 90% of you are anticipating an average growth of 11.5% growth this year. So we're starting to move again, which is nice. And the mix of the folks, most of you in that about 12% growth this year, is interesting. So uh, what we're seeing is a blend of uh, in-house owned uh, unit at about this level. We've got in-house private cloud actually stepping up a little bit and then co-location stepping up uh, further, and then at the top, uh, managed services starting to come into play. So there's a pretty even step up of those four services. Which brings me to my last point, most important point, actually about 2014. And 2014 is the midway point. And what we mean by the midway point, it's the year that cloud adoption actually moves beyond uh, that midway point. And so we're going to start to see heavy uptake of cloud services like Office 365 uh, and continued investment by companies 
to uh, lay out those cloud services now through 2016. We mentioned 2016, according to Gartner, remember, is the year of the cloud. So we're well on our way. And so now what we've done is, so we've set the stage for 2014, uh, highlighted what most of you are working on, and looked into the future a bit. And so now let's see if we can't get you uh, there a bit faster and uh, with some airboard, airbags ready to deploy if needed. So we're going to try and keep you safe. So let's talk about some things which may either move you to on-prem or may actually keep you uh, on-prem if you're operating in that scenario. And, and the first one is if you have a provider uh, fail you. And you know that's a big F on the scorecard, report card, that none of us want to see. And you, you may give that provider an F for multiple reasons. Uh, they may have too much downtime. That's never good. Uh, they can't scale or grow with you. Uh, or their support may be uh, unresponsive or doesn't meet your needs. Another big concern of a service provider is uh, concern, uh, this is going back to my auditing days, is concern about them as a going concern. So in other words, will they stay in business? And I have a story for you. There's a uh, storage cloud provider called Nervanix. And Nervanix uh, was doing a lot of enterprise cloud storage. And they actually shut their doors on October 15th of 2013. And what that did to uh, a lot of folks who had data stored there was it caused a bit of a panic. See, what Nervanix did was they gave, notified all their customers, uh, they're out on the West Coast, notified their customers two weeks ahead of time and said, uh, you need to migrate your data off because we are closing up shop. And they had petabytes of data. And just to give you some perspective on what sort of stress this put on some fairly significant enterprise customers, uh, over a one gig link, it would take close to 13 days to retrieve 150 terabytes of storage uh, over a WAN link, so wide area network connection. Uh, that's not a whole lot of data, probably relative to most of us, uh, and they probably had a lot more. So you can imagine the people getting on a plane and flying out to, I think they're in Palo, they were in Palo Alto, and uh, trying to get their data back, probably on um, external drives. Uh, so you can see if you've been doing business with Nervanix late in 2013, when you finally got your data back, you probably wanted more of the following, and that was control. And um, control uh, and keeping things on-prem or moving them uh, back to on-premises is about the feeling that if I can't, uh, if I don't own it, I can't guarantee that it will stay up uh, or get fixed in a timely fashion. You know, when we're speaking about control, the next thing that you probably think about is loss of security control. Uh, that's a, also a, a huge or a huge concern right now for most organizations. And then since we're talking about SharePoint, let's talk about control of that SharePoint environment and what may be very important to you, and that's the SharePoint, uh, some custom code that a lot of you have deployed and not being able to run or being broken by ongoing, ongoing cloud updates. Uh, huge concern right now with the enterprise customers. Uh, another important talking point around SharePoint uh, specifically in control is integration with the rest of the Microsoft stack. Uh, it seems like some of these things don't work particularly well if you don't have tight integration uh, on the back end. And speaking of SharePoint, uh, another thing which may cause some concern is a, where is my SharePoint data uh, living? And that brings us to data sovereignty. And I've got a couple statements for you here. And the first one being from Google Apps. And it, Google Apps, in their T's and C's, their terms and conditions, it says that Google may transfer, store, and process customer data in the U.S. or any country in which Google or its agents maintain facilities. Uh, Office 365 has the following in its terms and conditions. Customers may choose where their data is stored to start, but will the provider give notice when customer data is transferred to a new country? No, it will not. Uh, so... Some of these things may not give you a warm and fuzzy feeling when it comes to data sovereignty, and you need to be careful if you've got sensitive information which can't cross borders. Uh, just make sure that you're aware of where that data may flow to. And you can't talk about data sovereignty 
without talking about compliance. In compliance, it's turning out to be an alphabet soup uh, of compliance standards. And some of the more common compliance standards that you're hearing are HIPAA for the healthcare industry, FedRAMP for federal organizations, and SSAE 16 for cloud providers. I think what's interesting for me from an audit perspective is that some providers seem to be trying to weaken the audit practice of verification by not allowing their customers to see where their data lives and this increases your risk. Uh, so for instance, as an auditor, I need to be able to go and actually look at those servers and then verify that that data is where we say it is, uh, and that makes it uh, difficult to do. Another thing from both an engineering and an audit perspective is that multi-tenant environments are intrinsically uh, more susceptible to problems and do increase risk uh, and are not recommended for sensitive or regulated data. And since we've mentioned risk, let's look more closely uh, at that topic. So remember, we're still talking about things which may keep us on-prem or move us back or, or take us, uh, move us from the cloud back to on-prem or keep us on-prem. And so risk is really about, you know, asking the question, what is your risk tolerance? So what is your risk versus reward analysis? What's that look like when you're looking at possibly moving to storage or moving to CRM? And then how do you mitigate those risks once you've actually identified them? Uh, and uh, an interesting problem is, you know, what happens if that risk turns into a threat uh, like it did for Edward Snowden? Um, Edward Snowden in the NSA issue is, is a huge problem, and we'll talk about that some more. If you hadn't heard the bad the backstory on Mr. Snowden, it's it's really quite interesting, and I'll, I'll give you some insight into it. So uh, Snowden was actually flying from his home in Hawaii to Hong Kong uh, to re release those NSA documents to the Guardian and Washington Post. Uh, once he released 1% of those documents, which he had access to, to those newspapers, uh, the U.S. immediately revoked his passport and labeled him a fugitive. And Snowden was flying back from Hong Kong uh, and was actually on layover in Russia when uh, his passport was no longer valid. He was destined for Ecuador at that point and ended up uh, being detained in Russia for 40 days while they were trying to figure out what to do with him. Uh, right now, he's trying to get permanent asylum in France and Germany, and he has a Russian passport, which they gave him for one year, and that expires on July 31st. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see what he does uh, this summer. Why is the NSA such an important factor right now? Uh, the NSA, National Security Agency, and Snowden uh, revelations have irreparably hurt the U.S. Uh, technology um, all over the world. And there's now a Chinese saying called Qu Sik Wei, which literally means to de-Cisco. And it's interesting because China national software is growing 250% uh, right now, and Cisco, IBM, and Microsoft are down. And why is there this huge purging of Cisco equipment in the Far East? Well, that is the belief that the NSA has made deals uh, with Cisco and now has a backdoor into all of this equipment. And I think we've also heard the same thing uh, from Symantec, Microsoft, and some of, some of the other major players. Uh, so it, it's a huge problem and it's affecting uh, GDP uh, in the U.S. All right, so now it's time for us. We're going to move on to uh, what may move you to the cloud. So um, hope I haven't scared you too much. Uh, we're going to talk about the cloud now. So these are some things which may take you to the cloud uh, or keep you in the cloud. And uh, the first one and the most important one, which I get excited about, are the people. And for me, the people are always the difference. And what may move you to the cloud is that people are, are really hard to find, they're hard to train, and they're hard to retain. And we've probably all experienced that issue uh, with some of our own people and organizations for instance, in Exchange, SharePoint, our link, our link admin has left, and now you have a single point of failure 
or worse, there's no one to support that environment. And so what do you do? You, you start to scramble. And that's where a cloud uh, managed service provider could step in and start managing some of that workload for you while you either augment that staff uh, or maybe you just leave it with them if they're able to take good care of you. Uh, another reason to look at the cloud is when it's hardware or software refresh time, so an upgrade. Uh, who in the audience, who of you likes change? Uh, I know I do not, and most IT folks will say uh, change makes us very nervous. Uh, in our world, change is when things break, uh, and a hardware software refresh is all about change. And so that may be a good time to look at cloud because all those upgrades require significant hardware spend and cloud can significantly help with cash flow. Uh, upgrading the next version of Exchange, SharePoint, or Link is painful and expensive and Office 365 or Microsoft Cloud Provider are viable options for at least some of that workload. Uh, I'll tell you about a story that uh, we had access to a recent SharePoint project where a small enterprise was trying to migrate from SharePoint 2010 to 2013 and uh, their team tried for three months to get their data and customizations moved over and they just they struggled they were frustrated and close to abandoning the project and they called a SharePoint specialist group uh, that we know well and who they have strong expertise and they had the right blend of expertise experience and tools and they got the job done in a weekend literally two days so you know one thing that we've noticed uh, is that SharePoint as it becomes more Simplified for the users, it's becoming more complex on the back end to manage. So having access to the right people is critical. All right, so I've got a number for you, and it's a big number, and that number is 508,000. So 508,000. And why is that important? 508,000 is the estimated number of jobs lost in 2013 due to intellectual property losses from cyber espionage. And uh, the source on that is uh, estimating the cost of cybercrime by CSIS. Um, what is that all about? What's that mean? It means that American intellectual property, or IP, is being systematically siphoned off to countries like Russia and China, where it is sold to competitors, and who are using this knowledge to get to market faster. And you know, how does that affect all of us? Well, it absolutely does, because it's de decreasing demand for your products which in turn affects your workforce and ultimately devalues your company. It's a huge problem. And uh, the next number I want you to think about is $11. So what is $11? Uh, $11 is the price of a USDA grade A beef hamburger in a restaurant in the United States right now. And uh, I have that as I, I think I was hungry when I wrote that. Um, but now I want you to think about that $11 and that hamburger and add six more zeros to that. So $11 million. And $11 million is the average annualized cost of cybercrime incurred per organization. And the source on that is Anissa Thread Landscape Mid-Year Report 2013. And so let's talk about a recent breach and what that may cost. And so Target pops in everyone's mind, I think. Uh, and what was interesting with the Target story was I have a, a very good friend uh, who's ex-Fed and who is in the cyberspace. And we had lunch the day after the Target breach uh, was announced. And uh, I asked him, what do you think this is going to end at? How many people are going to be affected? And he told me, he said it's going to be a very, very big number. And I think they were at 20 million uh, folks at that point. And I was thinking maybe 40 or 50 million. Uh, he was thinking upward of 100. And so, you know, that number climbed, continued to climb each month or each week. And I think they ended at uh, a little south of 100 million. So one in four Americans were actually affected by that breach. So it was considerable. And I, a lot of us, including myself, we ended up canceling credit cards. And it was, uh, it's a problem. You know, so there's one thing to think about here because Target's, Exposure and problems are just beginning. Uh, there are now class action suits being filed. Uh, there seem to have been some negligence, possibly. They knew about some things and didn't correct them. And it's going to be a big problem for them. So why is this an issue? Most of the cloud providers can do this sort of thing better. 
than we can trying to handle them on-prem. So uh, cloud is actually safer, and $11 million goes a long way. My guess is that Target, they may add another zero to that number, or it may cost them uh, $100 million when they're done. So we'll see all about that. Um, another interesting thing to talk about now, which is important to be aware of, is that the tools that people are using for these compromises are now readily available on the black market. Most of them are being developed and sold in Taiwan, uh, and I can tell you about this uh, POS uh, system that came in, this, this attack came in through uh, a heating and cooling vendor, uh, and they sold that to them for $5,000. So this is not a lot of money. Denial of service, point of sale of POS, SQL injection, injection attacks, they are all readily available for folks to, to easily buy and get into your systems. Um, it, it, is, it is very real, and uh, the tools the bad guys are using are, are readily available. So now that we're talking about this sort of environment, uh, let's talk about something we can't afford not to talk about, and that's the elephant in the room and security. So security is an interesting conversation in 2014 because it's kind of the dirty little secret. Uh, you know, when we start talking about uh, security, we're talking about breaches, remediation, uh, lack of expertise. Uh, folks uh, on-prem can't keep up with the rapid pace of the changes and the attacks that we just mentioned coming out of uh, Taiwan for sale. And so uh, the thing to remember here is that service providers are always going to do security better. They just are. And curiously enough, Gartner considers security to be the number one focus of enterprises in the U.S. for 2014. So if you're going headed to a Gartner event, you're going to hear a lot about security because that's top of mind uh, for a lot of people. Another thing to talk about with the cloud and why you may want to either stay in the cloud or go to the cloud is agility. And I really think this is a key component and benefit of cloud. Um, being able to move faster, get data faster, and make those decisions faster gives you a huge advantage over a competitor. It's all about being able to get what you need done right now and get to market faster. So agility is huge for the cloud. Another component of the cloud is reliability. And, you know, the facts are in that a mature cloud provider will always be more reliable uh, than your on-prem install, you know, period. Reliability is all about uptime. And uh, when you start thinking about what that downtime does to uh, damage productivity, your brand, and morale, uh, it's critical. And if you've ever had an exchange server go down for your organization, you understand how important uh, these things are. I think with I think now in 2014, we take a lot of this for granted. Uh, but reliability is critical. And service providers, again, are, they're always going to have better uptime. Another piece, which I think which is important for cloud and which we sometimes overlook, and that's uh, innovate. And I want you to think about innovation because it's kind of the buzzword and it seems to be getting overused a bit. But let's talk about why innovation is really critical to your organization and how cloud can get you to this magical place uh, of IT. There's a problem right now in which uh, IT is in danger of losing budget and relevance to the marketing department. Uh, the fact is that marketing is driving revenue and has the ear of the CEO. Let's talk about a process, and it's the evolution of IT. And the evolution of IT, there are three stages. And optimize, which we talked about before, if you remember that in one of our early discussions. Um, transform, uh, remember we talked about aligning with uh, business goals. And then innovation is actually the last stage of evolution of IT. And innovation, uh, we're trying to create new products or services um, and become a revenue stream for the company. So no longer just a cost center, but uh, we want to generate new revenue. So again, that evolution of IT, first stage is optimize. And so that's making the most of what you have. Transforming, that's about uh, aligning those business, business goals across 
all those silos that you have. And then innovating is actually about creating those new products and services. And you know, here's the thing, IT needs the cloud to move beyond that optimization phase, which uh, where we're at right now, we're, most of us, most of you are sitting in between the optimization and transformation stage. So we're starting to work on that second piece, but we've got to get to the innovation uh, last phase faster if we're going to make a dent um, and get to the table with the CEOs. Once we get to the innovation, uh, IT can use its team to focus on innovating and creating value for the company, not just being that expense as I mentioned. And so my, my question to you is, you know, where are you? Uh, are you spending time optimizing, transforming, or innovating? I mentioned before that most of us are operating in between the optimization and transformation stage. And what are the tools being used to get us into each of these stages? These are worth explaining. So most of us are using optimization, uh, using colocation to get us into the optimization phase, so that first stage of IT evolution. The second stage is the transform, and we're using managed services to get us into that stage. And that's where most of us are right now. We're starting to implement managed services so that we can do some other things. Now the last stage of that IT evolution is to innovate. And that's where managed cloud starts to come into place. We've got uh, optimized, that's co-location, most of us are through that phase. Transform, that's managed services, that's what, what most of us are working on now. And then innovate is the managed cloud, and that's where we're all headed uh, over the next two years. So how do we get there? How do we continue to move through those stages and move from co-location to manage services, to manage cloud, and ultimately innovate? Well, the, it's using a blend of on-prem and cloud, and we know what that's called. That's called a hybrid. And you hear this all the time, and you hear it for good reason. And that hybrid is the vehicle for IT to safely evolve and ultimately become an innovator. Uh, CenturyLink recently pulled their customer customers' IT execs and found that 70% of IT will outsource to a hybrid cloud model in the next five years. And that sources the Global IT Leadership Report, January 2014. So some really fresh data there. Um, hybrid is all about, you know, there's no need to dive in head first. Uh, let's dip our toe in and find out how deep that pool is and find something, find a win and find out what works. You know, current SharePoint hybrid map that we're seeing right now is some folks may have SharePoint uh, internet on-prem, they may have a partner-hosted extranet or public-facing site, and Office 365. And you can absolutely make those environments talk to each other uh, via ADFS, Federation. Uh, so single sign-on, all those things are possible right now. Uh, so a question I would have for you is, you know, if you think about your environment, uh, you probably have a hybrid situation either going on or in incubation, uh, and you're starting to really look seriously at it. So, you know, what are you using today, and, and what hybrid uh, makes sense for you in the near future. Let's talk about the uh, hybrid of in-house and outsourced IT solutions over the next 10 years. And over the next two years, what we're seeing is the in-house uh, purchasing trending down sharply. So, so in other words, you know, all this equipment that we're buying, uh, we're seeing a sharp decrease in buying our own equipment. So the next 12 months, we're going to see a sharp decrease down. So kind of a reverse hockey stick, if you will. Um, managed services is starting to increase, and also co-location is increasing. But as we move out to two years, and remember, that's the 2016 year, well, why that is such an important year is uh, that year of the cloud, according to Gartner, is when outsourced cloud and in and in-house uh, owned intersects. So we've got, again, that in-house owned uh, decreasing sharply, but now we've got cloud outsource starting to hockey stick up, and they're actually intersecting. I can move that down for my face, huh? Uh, right at the two-year mark, so that 2016 is when that in-house and outsource cloud they actually connect, and so that's that's why it's really important. So the next five years, if you go out even further, you'll see a dominant trend of outsource cloud uh, continuing on an aggressive upward path. And remember why that was important was you know, that's how we get to that uh, golden state of innovation for IT. So that managed cloud is where we're all headed.
So here's some interesting things for you. So uh, fresh data on what's most important to a CIO and a cloud provider. What is most important to a cloud provider, to a CIO and a cloud provider? So the number one, stringent cloud security. No surprise there. Security is on everyone's mind, top of mind for all of us. Uh, number two is uh, proven IT and in infrastructure experience. So have they done it before successfully? If I'm going to give them some of my things, they better take good care of it and have done it before. Three is best of breed technology, whatever it may be. Are they using the latest and greatest? Uh, is it what I need? And are they the uh, leader in that area? Uh, fourth is global scale. Makes sense. We all want data centers uh, and our data close to the end user uh, to decrease latency. And the last one's interesting because we don't talk about it very much, but it is important. So the, the CIO is most important last thing for cloud providers, flexible contracts. So are they willing to work with you? Uh, are they going to meet your, your conditions that you need? So will their terms and conditions match up with your business goals? So again, from the top, you've got stringent cloud security, proven IT infrastructure, best of breed technology, global scale, and the last being flexible contracts. So we're winding down, and the, the question really does become about tipping point. You know, is you know, should I stay or should I go? And if any of you saw my my teaser for this deck, that you know, that's uh, the Clash's song. Should I stay or should I go? You, you've got a few things here to to consider. You know, on one hand, we're talking about the control of on-prem. You know, the ability to write SharePoint custom code and iterate without disruption of constant vendor updates, which may happen in an Office 365 environment or Google? Um, do you need the agility of the cloud to get to market now and move like a startup? Uh, so control of on-prem versus the agility of the cloud. Or how about did the security of the NSA or the target breach spook you and tip you back towards on-prem? Uh, I hear that conversation happening often and it is spooking some folks. Uh, then again, thinking cloud because you may need your cash to invest in a game changer for your company and not hardware our software. So I'm going to leave you with three questions for you to help find your own tipping point. And the first one is, you know, what is your top priority? So what is your top priority? Is it security, agility, or reliability? And if you answer that question, it's going to help move you one way or the other. So my second question for you is, you know, what is your timeline? Are you trying to move in days, months, or years to get your particular IT project completed? Answering that question will also move you one way or the other. And then the last one I have for you, which I personally think is most important for you, is, you know, what stage is IT in? So are you optimizing right now? So are you trying to make the most with what you have, still squeaking out efficiencies? Uh, are you transforming? So are you trying to link those silos and get consistency across your business units? Or are you actually innovating? Are you creating new products or services and turning IT into a revenue source for your company? Answer those three, and I think you're going to find for yourself what your tipping point is and where you should head to. So again, I would like to thank you for joining me for SP24. It was a uh, great experience. I'm glad I got to share some time with you, and I hope you uh, walk away some, with some valuable knowledge. Feel free to shoot me uh, emails, or you can get me on Twitter, at FPWebRob, F-P-Web-R-O-B, and I would be happy to talk some more about cloud strategy with you. Thank you. Have a great day.